Greetings, and welcome to the Mount Rushmore podcast. My name is Jeff, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friends, Richard. Hello. And Michael. Howdy. Richard and Michael debate and deliberate many aspects of the world that is around us and beyond what we perceive and see, I imagine. And this week is no different, um, but roll credits. We're debating or deliberating the Mount Rushmore of end credit songs. Richard, what? How? Well, ah, well, this weekend, <laughs> watching a movie that had a really kick-ass song at the end of the uh, at the very last shot, very last scene of the movie that kind of rolled into the credits, and it just got me thinking about like, you know, how the many filmmakers. That's the last. I mean, it is. It's the last thing that you're going to remember about the movie. Is yeah, the song that plays over the final scene, and like I said, oftentimes it bleeds into the credits. So for many filmmakers, this is kind of a really big deal to get the exactly the right song to kind of leave you with whatever whatever impression they want to leave you with. So yeah. I just thought it would be a fun topic for us to go back go back to and kind of see which ones we love. Yeah. Well, I would like to also just invite people to stay till the very end because that's what everybody mm-hmm. does on social media. Um, you know, wait for the ending because right. Mr. Will Smith. Will, Will Smith has agreed to rap a song that is custom to this podcast for the end credits. It'll be That's about the podcast. podcast. It'll be about the podcast itself that we just, yeah. you just it, listen to. It'll mention main characters. It'll it'll kind of infer things about storylines and things like that. But it'll be fun and it'll be danceable and it'll be exciting. So, so we tried to get LL, we tried to get LL Cool J to do yeah. it, but sure, of course, he'd done, he'd done that already. Too yeah, he did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Michael, you must be the person who's starting because Richard thunk it. Yeah, and you know it's funny. I this was this was a real toss up for my first choice because, I, but I have to stay true to myself and I have to stay true to Mount Rushmore. And the obvious first pick is the Faces song "Ooh La La" at the end of oh. Rushmore. The, this is like the George Washington as the perfect end song to the perfect <laughs> movie. That also happens to feature uh, our name in the title. Um, yeah. This is the movie that I think of absolutely first as the song that just rolls, that is just this exuberance of um, emotion and celebration at the end of Rushmore after um, uh, after everything has come together. You know, um, all of the, you know, sh- what is it like angst and Mm -hmm. all of the uh, just uh, feelings of regret and uh, everything that um, Max Fisher has gone through and put his friends through all come together in this just amazing, you know, 1960s song that is just, it's about dancing celebration and just the, even the, there's just like one of the first, like the, one of the, you know, the chorus line of, if I knew then what I know now is just so perfect and it so perfectly encapsulates everything that Wes Anderson has done in this one film. But then it also makes like this amazing template for what he's done in other films. I couldn't help but think of all the other times where he's used an end song for like celebrative purposes. And I don't know if this, if any other songs from a Wes Anderson movie is on Richard's list. Um, but it happens again and again where he has like, you know, Wes Anderson is such an interesting filmmaker visually and story wise and character wise and musically. And, but he also like creates like these templates for himself where you can kind of see he's kind of, he's not making the same movie over and over, but he has a pattern and he has themes and he likes things that he comes back to. And like a song of celebration kind of repeats again and again. And certainly in, another one of my picks i have another song of celebration but that just sums up everything that's happening but this is the song and this is the soundtrack and this is the the movie that like immediately just stands out as like of course this is this is a person person that is so expertly crafted in what he wants to do visually with his actors but then also musically that it's just it all comes together and i can't imagine uh, I can't imagine a, a better ending for a movie or a, a more perfect song. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I have a different Wes Anderson uh, film on my list. So mm-hmm. I'll just leave it with that one. And it's the one that I was watching this weekend that uh, got me thinking about it. And it's from the fantastic Mr. Fox. And yeah. it's Let Her Dance by the Bobby Fuller Four. Yeah. Oh. Again, very much in that same vein, you know, a 60s song. This one a little bit more obscure. So kind of heading down the... Uh, the 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 road of 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 slightly more obscure '60s stuff, but again, this really exuberant song they've that, that goes along perfectly with they've you know Mr. Fox has defeated the farmers and has have wound up inside this supermarket that they're going to be living under, and they can go up there and get whatever supplies and juice boxes and <laughs> sweets and anything else that they want anytime they want. And after he gives his speech, Mr. Fox turns on his transistor radio. And this is the song that comes out. Now, I, I am a little confused as to how Bobby Fuller 4 is on the transistor radio in London, wherever they're supposed to be. I don't know if there's an, an oldie station that specializes in playing really deep cuts because that's a pretty deep cut to be on the radio let's be honest but it winds up working out perfectly and like a lot of the reasons michael said this is you know it's not surprising that someone who is who takes so much care to curate his movies that that also extends to the soundtracks and specifically to the final songs in the soundtracks i mean you could just go over and over again Wes Anderson films and kind of that's one of his signatures is having a great song to close the movie. Yeah, I I had, um, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I was going to say what, what I think will be interesting is as we move through uh, the list to determine what role the song serves. And I think as a person who is a screenwriter, as well as the director, and maybe, I don't know, a producer, um, I've, learned in whatever classes I've taken that writing serves to reveal character. And even though he's not scripting the lyrics, he's choosing the text as as uh, uh, the lyrics extend the point of view of the characters. And in, in the case of Rushmore, and maybe this is the case of Fantastic Mr. Fox, I believe in, in Rushmore, we could see the statement, I wish I knew then what I know now could be applied to both uh, um, Max Fisher and Bill Murray's character. I feel. I feel Herman like, Bloom. Uh, Herman. Yeah. <laughs> Herman Bloom. That uh, it's it maybe in choosing that song, uh, uh, Anderson is choosing to extend his uh, to expand to reveal more of his character point of view. I think um, uh, I I want to touch on the Life Aquatic because I think that was that was definitely the third movie of his that I was thinking of in terms of like a celebratory like ending song of his. But first, I just I want to dive in just real quickly. This isn't one of my picks at all. Into the movie Boss Baby. Oh no! <laughs> As my son has been watching, Do we have to like yes, <laughs> nonstop uh, for some reason. I don't know exactly know why, but I I got to get this out. So one of the very interesting things, and I think of music is there's like this motif of this kid singing uh, the Beatles Blackbird. And I think we talked about it real recently. Um, How much fucking money it must cost for any band or any movie to use like a Beatles song in their movie. Right. Yeah. And this kid sings Blackbird a number of times to his like the boss baby child. And it's, it's just this thing that's, that's throughout it. And I think of these movies not only do they cost anywhere from 10 million to 50 million to a hundred million dollars to make, but then you have to like, part of that is like getting the rights to these songs. And so someone like a Quentin Tarantino or someone like Wes Anderson, there's so much music that they want to put into their movie and it must cost so much money just for the rights to feature this song on their, um, within the movie or to feature it within a soundtrack. And I kept thinking to myself, watching this with my son being like, what is what was it about the script that like Paul McCartney was like, yeah, 
just you can use the lyrics willy nilly. It's yeah. just the money yeah. that he got from it. I assume. I don't know. Very. Yeah. Uh, but I just had to make that quick aside that all of these choices, all these songs that are featured in things like for the faces or for the Bobby Fuller four, it's not like no one is anyone is going out and really trying to get a Bobby Fuller four song. So when they're like approached, I'm sure they're like, of course you can, of course you, can, of course you can use this song. Why, why, why wouldn't you? You know. Um, but then I think of some a movie like uh, The Life Aquatic where the entire movie is like scattered with like Mark's Mark mother's ba kind of little vignettes, but then also someone singing Portuguese versions of like David <laughs> Bowie songs, right. Mm -hmm. Throughout the entire thing. I forget the Sergey. I forget. His no, name. George. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. I, I don't know his name, but um, so he's singing all these David Bowie songs throughout the movie, just on a guitar, just acoustically. And then the end of the movie hits and there's this triumphant showing of his most recent, you know, underwater film. And then they walk out of it. And then the actual David Bowie is singing Queen Bitch. And it's just this, it's just this confidence, you know, like something out of, uh, oh, Richard, you'll, you'll kill me. What's, there was a movie where they're walking through like an LA aqueduct. Oh, it's a uh, Buckaroo Banzai. Yeah, the, this feeling of like the last Buck scene is on the shop. For John. Yeah, remake of Buck Rubens' yeah. final scene. Yeah, thank you. And uh, it's just so it's just like so uplifting at the end, and you're just like, oh, I'm with these. I'm with this crew. I'm with them. And I think he does that so masterfully in just all of these. Whatever he does, these celebration movies, whether it's Rushmore or Richard's um, Fantastic Mr. Fox. Yeah. Well, it's uh, those are cool choices and i think i hope we are able to ask ourselves like what other uh, purposes the songs are used for um so uh what do you got michael for your second my second i'm gonna stay within celebration for a little bit okay. and i'm gonna talk about i gotta read the name of it <clears throat> pardon me it is uh the band is augie's great musical band playing the song Symphonic Nabuala as the end song from Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Now, oh boy. I'm, I'm bringing this up for a couple of reasons. One, it is a celebration song. Two, it's this diegetic song that's actually being played in these moments, this moment of celebration where the Nabu people and the, the Gungans have defeated the trade federation who cares all of that is, it's, it's a whole lot of who gives a shit right but it's like it's a big you know parade and party and the music really is all horns and celebration and there's a chorus in the background it's very uplifting and they cut to all the different shots of different people you know jar jar getting off this stupid giant lizard thing that he rides and padme standing there the queen standing there with looking at uh little anakin and the robots and the big fat uh frog guy played by uh, brian blessed bless his soul <laughs> and uh there's a song that's playing and it's what's interesting about the song the most interesting thing about the song to me is that it is uh the emperor's song from return of the jedi played in a, a higher key if you kind of listen oh. to this song again and you it's the same notes it's the same thing but the emperor's song is played in this minor key of this kind of do, 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 as he's like, you know, fighting mm -hmm. or as Luke and Darth Vader are fighting. And it's just the way that um, uh, John Williams is so perfect as a, uh, someone that scores movies that he could have written anything and it would have been great, just a triumphant song, but that he took his song that he wrote 30 years prior, 20 years prior, whatever, and reconfigured it into a celebra celebration, which was actually just a precursor to all of the destruction that it leads up to, is, um, I think, just masterful as him as a, a musical artist. And I don't know if that's something that George Lucas asked him to do, but it's one of the few times that like, there's actual diegetic music playing within Star Wars that actually ties into the scene that is this big explosion of celebration of we've defeated these bad guys, not knowing 
the, all the darkness that's coming. And um, ridiculous as it sounds, I think it's just the perfect ending of that mm. actual stupid movie, which is two hours of like, you know, pizza by Alfredo, hot circle of garbage, you know? Just. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think uh, Williams just, just phoned it in? Like he said, uh, I'll do a, do a control S on the computer <laughs> and save as and then downshift it and then just do a copy and paste there. basically yeah i would love you know you know part of me would be like that's something that i would do but yeah. uh, <laughs> i think <laughs> i think that definitely he is someone who is so thoughtful as a music writer um and uh no i don't think yeah so. didn't he reverse engineer some themes for the characters based on a theme he did previously was it was it Anakin and Padme's themes that mm. were kind of a deconstruction of Leia's theme or something like that I think, I think I'm, he I'm, had I'm, done you're probably like right I mean you know he I think that there is like I can't think we've talked about this many times I don't I can't think of things in terms of the way music is written I don't quite understand it I'm always amazed when music is written first and then lyrics are added on top of it i i'm always the other type of person yeah. who lyrics first and then music is written underneath it or something mm -hmm. so i it's for who however somebody writes music in terms of which part do they write for do they just write a melody and then they just start filling it in with horns and drums and cellos and yeah all this. i have no idea but um you know i'll 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 fall on the sword. I'll die on the cell that it's a great end song to an <laughs> odd movie, but speaks so much more. Well, the, I, I think there the filmmaker is, um, is now giving us text that, um, that if one were to listen, if you're sh sharp eared or then on repeat viewing, it's, it does. Yeah. It, cr it extends part of the text to understand that, uh, uh, this is a universe, a galaxy filled with patterns that repeat and, mm. and yeah, yeah. Light and dark. Yeah. Richard, what do you got? All right. Second choice uh, is where is my mind from the uh, final scene of fight club. Also on my oh. list. Okay. Oh, wow. right. Should be um, pixie song. And this is an example for me of a, of an example of what I have to believe was a filmmaker constructing the final scene with a specific song in mind because the way that the spoiler alerts with all of these movies coming up at the end <laughs> um when ed Listener, norton pause go watch fight club go watch fight go watch fight club back. go watch fight club make sure you actually get the intended point out of it then come back um when Ed Norton shoots himself in the face and then doesn't die. And then all of the bombs that he has planted around all of the financial buildings start going off. They go off in almost perfect sequence to the drum part that kicks off. Where is my mind? And, you know, he tells, he tells Helena Bottom Carter's character, you've met me during a weird, weird period in my life. And then the actual like guitars kick in at that point. It's just, it's constructed too perfectly not to have been done specifically with the editing and timing of that song in mind. Like there are sure. a lot of instances where I imagine where, you know, this would be great if we got this song, but if we can't get this song, maybe we'll use this song instead. And the, you hear a lot of happy accidents where songs wind up getting used because they really wanted to use a different song. Like I think, I think the Rushmore soundtrack, uh, Wes Anderson wanted to use all kink songs and for some reason couldn't get all of the rights. So he wound up just making it more kind of general sixties kind of Brit pop, British pop sort of stuff. Um, but I don't think that's the case here. I think this was a very deliberate choice by David Fincher to use this song, which lyrically is about someone questioning his own, reality and sense of self which fits in perfectly with the whole theme of the movie so i just it's just it's just kismet it's perfect i'll say this too um so far a lot of these songs that have happened that have 
we talked about are songs that like I wasn't very aware of. I wasn't familiar with this song in particular. It wasn't a song that I don't think had a lot of like radio play. I mean, the Pixies didn't have a ton of songs that were radio play songs. And I, it wasn't a band that I had really listened to much growing up in spite of all of the, uh, you know, um, alternative and whatever right music that i listened to it wasn't a song so when like this song that hits you like a ton of bricks like this all these buildings are explodes and just kind of everything explodes like the song just jumps out of nowhere and if you've never heard the song before it is so emotionally resonant within the scene itself and to have no context for who it was or the band or anything like that um it feels has the same sort of thing like listening to the kind of couple bands that we mentioned before were like, I hadn't heard that Faces song before. I hadn't heard that um, Bobby Fuller 4 song before. So like for a, a song to sound so new and be so powerful, I think is one of those things that a great filmmaker does is they're able to go deep into a catalog. That there's something that they're so passionate about and then brings it to the forefront. And they're just, and then you're, it reintroduces the song to, like a whole new audience, you know, and that has this emotional impact, you know, not kind of in the same way. Uh, like Bohemian Rhapsody, we talked about a few years, a couple episodes ago. I'm sure there's a generation, myself included. I don't know if I'd ever heard that song before Wayne's World. I'd heard a hmm. bunch of songs before, but I don't know if I had known of this one. So I'm sure for a lot of people, sometimes these songs that are so personal to a filmmaker, to a, an artist really have just create generate this whole new audience and this is certainly a song that um i've listened to hundreds of times in the last 20 years because of this movie because of that one particular scene i think of those uh filmmakers like i imagine um quentin tarantino has some dude who just makes him mixtapes all the time <laughs> you know uh you know like a, a hipster music person i think the cohen's have i forget the guy's name it seems like he produces all their albums he's probably just always on the lookout for groovy groovy cool songs but yeah that's such a uh profound and richard yeah that's fascinating to me to to even imagine that it wasn't uh, so synchronized to that song that it wasn't playing on set while they were recording that it's hard yeah to imagine that yeah richard do you want to do your third so that we're kind of caught up with Michael. Well, let's, sure. do, a quick, let's do a quick halftime. What's the so song? Are we halftime? Halftime? Yeah. Halftime. Let me put the halftime. Well, speaking of music. Where's the halftime? Do, uh, yeah. Where's our gentle, dopey halftime music that oh, yeah. I discovered long ago? <laughs> hey, everybody. Owen Powell. Who's, 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 the, who's the guy? The Coen Brothers musical guy. Uh. You know, pretty soon you're going to start listening. These listeners, you're going to start getting uh, uh, just topics from us that are stretching our desire, uh, stretching the limits of logic for uh, being current with the holidays. So we'll probably have like Andre the Giant Christmas, you know, mm. special or so. I, I'm trying to think of what, how we can, <laughs> what the topics you're going to uh, get from us in these last remaining months of the year. But uh, stick with us because we. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Mount, Mount Rushmore of Mick Foley characters, including Santa Claus, yeah. that he has played. Yeah. <laughs> that, covers, that covers all like four or five of them. I think yeah. it's we could leave one out, but I think that's that's got them all. But you could get we could ask the gift of you to give us topics. <laughs> that's right. Please uh, reach into your bag of topics and um, put them down our chimney to to what? precisely use a Christmas metaphor uh, mm -hmm. and. Because we'd love to ho 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 your topics here at the uh, um, Hanukkah Keep going. Keep going. menorah of Kwanzaa yep. corn. That is the right. Mount Rushmore podcast. <laughs> this is a fever dream. <laughs> I think I took mescaline before we started. Um, yeah, so uh, we'd love to hear some of your topics. And, you know, past suggestors have ended up being on, on the Mount Rushmore podcast. So that could be a bonus. And if you are in the witness protection program, you can use like one of like a one of those filters, a silhouetted light behind you. You don't have to be visible. Um, so do that. Give us the gift of you. 
And we are back, and Richard's going to catch up with Michael by sharing his third. Speaking of the witness protection program, Jeff. Whoa. Okay. Um, my way, the Sid Vicious version, played at oh, the awesome. end. Played at the end of Goodfellas. Of Goodfellas. Yeah. So we used to have Ray, Ray Liotta has gone. You know, Henry, Henry Hill at this point has gone into witness protection, and he's narrating this bit about his life in witness protection and how ultimately crummy it is compared to what he had before about how he can't even get a decent decent Italian food mm -hmm. how boring it is to be in the suburbs and he's kind of like walking out to get his newspaper and then all of a sudden in kicks in Sid Vicious's version of My Way which I think is just a incredibly smart choice what a, what a shocker Martin Scorsese making a good choice at the end of Goodfellas who knew <laughs> um but it's not the Sinatra version of it. It's not the version that everybody knows because that would be, it's almost like using the Sinatra version would only make sense for people who are still in the mob. And mm -hmm. Henry Hill, all his life, wanted to be a made guy like these heroes that he saw, you know, the, the Italian-American heroes that, that he he worshipped and idolized who were part of the mafia and he was never going to get there he was never going to be he was never going to be in like Sinatra mm -hmm. he was always going to be kind of floating around the outside a little bit and now that he's made his choice to go into witness protection he's not even he, he doesn't even get any part of that he's just a punk at this point some punk who ratted on them so why not have a, a punk song and that version of that song be the song that gets used. I love that choice. I, I think also the music tracks the chronology of that film. And were we to have My Way, it would have sent us back two decades. I think, yeah. Or a decade. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's this song about maybe having regrets, but more, more than that, not regretting things because... You chose to do things your way. You chose to do things, mm -hmm. in, 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 you know. These are the choices, and you're not, you wouldn't you wouldn't go back and change any of them. Now, is that yeah. really true with Henry Hill? I don't think so. And with Sid Vicious doing it, it's it's kind of the snotty punk version of it. Um, you yeah, know, we're, we're, it's a for suckers for for this type of character. He's, you know, he, I think from the moment that he's kind of talking to. Um, I can't remember uh, his future wife's name in it, but like, you know, he goes about doing a thing because that's the way it's just done. He walks into the back of the club and gets the best seat at the front and just hands him hands out twenties and fifties and hundreds. And she's just looking at him like, "What? this isn't the real world. And he's just like, this is, what are you talking about? This is just the way it mm -hmm. is. And I think he's just a character that has lived his life the way it is. And that's all he's ever known. And then, right. like, what does he? What does he care about? <laughs> what does he care about anything? He hasn't. He has no thoughts other than to what is happening to himself in the immediate future. In the immediate, not even the future. Just whatever's happening right now is what I need to do, because I need to do it. And this is the world I I know. Everything has to happen now. So, yeah, no, yeah no, he's no, pure exactly. id. Yeah, exactly. Yes, perfect. <laughs> yeah, he's pure id and. Who else is a better representation of that musically than Sid Vicious? Mm -hmm. So it makes so much sense that this would be how you would, the last memory you would want of this character would be framed by this song. Yeah, that's a fun choice. I also feel like uh, part of the text is Sid Vicious. It's almost like Sid Vicious lives because Sid Vicious was a person who kind of died at the, at the, uh, it, in a pool of his own uh, indulgences or uh, uh, judgments of error, <laughs> you know, right. the company that he's he's keeping, and that could have happened to Henry Hill um, had he kind of stayed in that company or had he uh, kept kept hurtling towards uh, disaster. Yeah, so that's that was well, a fun choice. All right, Michael, what's your fourth and final or third? No, my my final because my third was. Uh... 
agreed with you. With or, uh, oh, that's yeah. right. We agreed on Fight Club. That's right. Yeah. Uh, my last song is the song Midnight, The Stars and You, as performed by um, Ray Noble and his orchestra in the final scene in the movie The Shining, where it's oh, wow. the foxtrot that this very slow moving melodic foxtrot that starts as soon as um, you kind of center in on this dead face of Jack Torrance, like in the snow, freezing to death, and it starts to pull out and you pull back to the hotel and it's a slow zoom with these cuts and the zooming in like from the back of the hotel all the way to this you know black and white photograph of showing all these uh uh collection of photographs from various i assume they're all um new year's eve parties you know, they could be christmas parties they could be a ton but the one they zoom in on is this new year's eve party from like the 1920s and you zoom in right onto his beaming face just smiling there photoshopped or otherwise with all these other old characters just this so haunting this image of him just he's there he's always been there the theme of the movie is these ghosts and this repetition and this death and murder and chaos and all this stuff and it's just so perfect it's used earlier in the film like when he's in like the grand ballroom when he's kind of imagining or experiencing these ghosts and to have it repeated at the end at just the silent moment of just this song as it comes right into his face so close up and you're just you know uh it's so chilling and it just leaves you with this feeling of like not knowing what is really there was was he there from the 1920s is this the same person reincarnated is it just a person that looks like him is he a ghost is he uh, you know, this movie captures so many, so much of that feeling of, I have no idea, really. And I think that's part of it is so much of it is, is it a ghost? Is it a possessed hotel? Is, how is he connected to Danny that has this power? Is, did he murder somebody in the 1920s too? Is he the same? All of these things and just this haunting song that just plays over the end and leads right into the credits. It's so, it's so perfect. I mean, the movie is so weird in its own way. I wouldn't say it's a perfect movie, but it's just, it. it's a movie that definitely ha asks more questions than it answers. And then that final scene is just another, it's like just peeling off another layer saying like, guess what? You thought you were, you thought you knew this guy. You thought he was dead. You thought they killed him. He was possessed. And now you have no idea. Again, another, like, you just have no idea. But it's weird because it's like, I don't know why so many of my um, choices were like these weird celebrations, but it's definitely centering in on a, a picture of a celebration. It's a New Year's Eve party, but it's like a haunted, haunting sort of melancholic sort of thing. I don't know. Great movie. Yeah. Great song. Now I feel like Kubrick is known for using score uh, versus songs. You know, like he he might have a character singing when when, singing when he when he used when he used Judy as a punk in Barry Lyndon. I you know yeah. I was taken out of it a little bit, <laughs> right? But I, you know, yeah. Whatever. Well, yeah. The irony. Did... Go ahead. What's Go ahead, uh, we'll meet again at the end of of, of Strange Love? Right. Well, I was going to be, I was going to be my, I was going to be my last choice. Oh, actually. Yeah. I was going to say, did somebody mention a Kubrick film with a closing song from the 1930s? Cause do I have one for you, brother? Right. <laughs> Look at us. Uh, yeah. We'll meet again by Vera, by Vera Lynn, um, plays over the scenes of the nuclear Holocaust happening at the end of Dr. Strangelove. Which, of course, is this like bitter irony because the song We'll Meet Again was basically one of the rallying cries for the British troops during World War II. It kind of became known as the symbol of, of the war will eventually be over and we're going to win and our boys are going to get back home to, the, to their sweethearts and the women will be waiting for them with open arms whenever they're ready to return. So you contrast the meaning of this, the original meaning of the song with the visuals that are playing while the song is playing, which is 
no, you're not going to meet again. This is the end of civilization as we know it. This is nuclear holocaust. There will be no meeting again. But yet the song is playing this kind of this like reminder of, I don't know if it's a, a kinder, gentler warfare, but at least a warfare that doesn't wipe out all of humanity in the process. And I don't know if, uh, I don't know if Kubrick knew this or not, but apparently this song was part of a package of, of music that was, that the BBC had in underground radio stations during World War II and after World War II that was designed to be played for a hundred days after in the event of a nuclear attack. So that's a heck of a playlist. Yeah, I mean, I'd like I, to... th- I thought I made a pretty good one for like my birthday or for like uh, <laughs> Emily's birthday over this last year or for like sometimes they do like a Christmas one. But wow. Unfortunately, you dropped the bomb on me by the Gap Band was a little too <laughs> recent, so they couldn't oh, get it yeah. in there. But um, yeah, I just again with Kubrick, it's just this 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 idea of what's the most incongruous song we can play over over these scenes of death and destruction and we found the perfect song wow I hadn't ever heard about these songs I don't know how many songs there were it was was like for 100 days after 100 days nuclear attack there was supposed to be these morale boosting broadcasts yeah this pick this section of songs that were going to be played along with it and that was one of them Wow, it's uh, we'll meet again. Dance, dancing and in the street. I've, <laughs> I've yeah, got a lovely bunch water. of coconuts. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the Benny Hill, the Benny Hill, Jackie yeah, Sacks. Yeah, yes, of course. Yeah. Well, cool, dudes. What a great uh, selection of songs, and what a great topic, Richard. Thanks for uh, blessing us with this topic. Um, it's really cool. Uh, I think we got to go with uh, well. I'm, let me get the sound effect ready. I think we got to go with "Where's My Mind." Did it happen? Yeah, I can hear it. I, I hear the faint, okay. faint clanking. Oh, of, it's, repeat, uh, it's repeating. There we go. Oh wow. Okay. And let's. I think it's just a. Uh, I I love the midnight, the stars, and you. Let's go with Kubrick. Okay. Let's go with uh, "We'll Meet Again." Double Kubrick. And actually. then I just got to go with um uh um my way because i think that was a great capper for that uh that movie and and uh for all the italian stuff that uh scorsese did he always did a lot of um there's a lot scorsese was much more of a punk than i think people kind of realize yeah there's a lot sure yeah. absolutely yeah because god save the queen is it uh is in um um what is that movie he did about jesus Last Temptation of Christ. Yeah. yeah. Um, the Jesus movie. What was the Jesus movie? Yeah. The Should Jesus be in movie. Austin and Departed. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this has been the Mount Rushmore of songs that uh, for movie end credits. I'm always Jeff. I'm Richard. I'm Augie's Municipal Band. And here comes the Will Smith track. There you go. Oh, shoot. Mount Rushmore. Kind of... They raided the floor, <laughs> and now they're going to hit the door. There you go. <laughs>